Well, Jeffrey Bleich, it's wonderful to be here with you at Flinders University, where in the last 24 hours you've launched the Jeffrey Bleich Centre. Tell us a little bit about that, that exciting news, this, this new frontier that you're driving in this area of research. Well, I'm excited about um, every aspect of the center. I'm a little embarrassed about the fact that, uh, they, <laughs> <laughs> that it's my name, um, but i um, thrilled to be part of what Flinders is doing. Uh, Flinders, I think, has identified a space that um, uh, for academia and for the broader community that's been neglected up till now, which is how we think truly broadly about the digital ecosystem. We've been thinking up until now about uh, digital technology as you know, a set of opportunities for businesses, or we've thought about digital technology as a threat in terms of cyber. Um, we haven't really thought about the fact that digital technology is changing the way people live, breathe, work, <laughs> eat, um, um, and, and, and think about their lives. It's changing the way that we are um, governed and the way we will govern ourselves in the future. It has created all sorts of new um, opportunities, but also threats. And so um, thinking of it as an ecosystem, thinking of it as a, um, a, 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 an ecosystem which is particularly challenging for democracies mm -hmm. as opposed to other forms of government, uh, I think is, um, is, is uh, the beginning of a whole movement in, um, uh, in, in how academia and how communities work on this issue. So uh, that's what the center's about. It's about helping democracies do their job uh, to make human beings be the best version of themselves. And, um, and it's good to be part of the, the, the inception of it. You mentioned that it's an issue that's sort of been neglected up to this point. I feel like we've had a bit of a collective awakening across the globe around, wow, we, we haven't necessarily navigated entering into this digital period with the degree of consciousness and thoughtfulness we maybe should have. I'm interested, I mean, you've had a really distinguished career in law and public service. When did the thinking around the digital ecosystem start to, I guess, raise up on your agenda? You know, I think it came to me slowly as well. I think it came to all of us slowly, and, and that's normal. Um, what, what tends to happen with any major disruptive technology is at first people are just curious about it. And then they see the potential and they get very excited about it. And then you know, the economy starts shifting dramatically around it. And, um, and then some of the negative consequences start to take root. And people feel a little bit of pain, but they say, ah, oh, it's so good, I'm not gonna worry about a little bit of pain for all this good. She'll be right, as the Australians She'll be would right. say. Yeah, <laughs> and then eventually, uh, you get to a point where the pain is strong enough mm -hmm. that people say, okay, we've got to adjust um, our governance. We've got to adjust how we train our kids. We've got to adjust our educational system. We've got to adjust um, how we protect ourselves. Uh, that happened in the Industrial Revolution. That happened in the Second Industrial Revolution. And it's always a little late for <laughs> policymakers and for thinkers. So I worked on cyber starting in 1999. I did one of the first uh, cybersecurity cases for Microsoft. And I remember thinking, this is gonna be pretty big. <laughs> yeah. um, but I was still thinking just about cyber. I wasn't thinking about the broader set of ways in which digital technology was going to fundamentally change how democracies operate. Mm. And you touched on governance democracy a couple of times. What do you see as some of the major challenges for the Australia and for the globe to be thinking through right now? Well, I think in terms of um, security. We tend to think about um, privacy, and we think about people hacking into our systems. So one, one reason they'd hack in is to steal our, our data. Um, or they got access to our data and they're using it in ways that we never anticipated. Um, we worry about people you know, surveilling us. And we worry about uh, uh, people making it difficult for us to know the truth about basic things, you know, simply dirtying the information field. And we worry about them stealing from us, mm -hmm. you know, stealing money. And then we think about broader meta challenges like, you know, shutting down uh, water systems and um, energy grids and those sorts of um, uh, uh, kinetic attacks. Those are, I think, what we think about in terms of security. What I don't think we really thought about is degrading our ability to govern ourselves generally. And that's what the 2016 election showed us, is that security is much, much deeper. Um, there was nothing particularly illegal about having bots put out false messages and lies about what was going on in the United States. There was nothing particularly illegal about um, the, the Russian efforts to um, 
uh, again, dirty the information field in a political campaign and skew the election in one direction or the other. Uh, that yeah, they, they, they use devices that are, that are permitted in the World Wide Web. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it, it, it was a wake-up call that some of these tools you know, um, could be used to really undermine the biggest aspect of our security, which is our trust in one another. And so we have to become much more resilient. Um, governance, similar things. I think when we think about governance, we think about uh, what the government does. But governance is the set of norms that we all live by. Mm -hmm. And so some of this is about government laws and regulations and, and, and adapting, but some of it is just training ourselves to be more aware of threats and to adjust our behavior. Some of it is uh, going to be cultural. Some of it will be changing processes to make it more difficult for us to be fooled. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it is going to be adopting new tools uh, that, that will be developed to mitigate the bad aspects of other tools. And you mentioned that piece around how do we empower ourselves. You know, yeah. one of the, the centre's key goals is really around creating an accessibility in this technology conversation, mm -hmm. but also that piece around giving people agency and empowerment. Mm -hmm. What are the questions you think leaders listening to this conversation need to be asking themselves when they think about technology and the role it's playing in their own lives, but potentially in their organisations too? Yeah, I think they have to ask um, the fundamental question, which is, what are humans gonna, human beings going to do in this space? There was this there was this kind of heady moment at the beginning of the internet age where we thought uh, we could do things there that we don't do in the real world and it'll be okay. We can be anonymous. Um, we can have uh, open access to everything. Uh, I, I, I think, you know, people barely used passwords in the early days. Or well, they used one, two, three. <laughs> yeah, right. Everyone's password was password. Yeah, exactly. Right? Really secure. And, yeah. And I think there was generally a sense that we would behave differently in this domain than we have anywhere else. But what you learn as this domain gets more and more robust um, is that human beings take their humanity everywhere. Mm -hmm. And so we will do anything in, in the cyber domain that we would do in, in, in the real world. The virtual world is just a reflection of the real world. And any tool that's there, like any tool in the US um, or Australia or in our physical world, um, can be used for good or for evil. You know, a hammer can build a house or it can break a skull. And it depends on who's wielding it and what their intent is. And so being able to set up an environment in which we govern uh, this, this new domain, this fifth domain, in the same way that we think about governing our physical world is really the question that people have to ask. What will human beings do with this? <laughs> and usually it, it'll, it'll you know, be good and bad. <laughs> and I love that frame. And I think it gets to a, a quote I've heard quite a bit about technology, that it's neither inherently good or bad. It's yeah. a choice you know, around the application and, and the use of it, absolutely. Right. You've touched on this piece around um, you know, kind of governance. And one of the things we're seeing is, is really different models emerging across the world. You know, you've got GDPR in Europe. You've got very live conversations right now in the US around their governance model different strategies that different countries are taking. How important is the bilateral relationship between the US and Australia in this space? I think it's really healthy. Um, one of the problems is that um, the passions of the day in a particular country um, and, and, and the reflexiveness of democracies can be a real disadvantage for us. Uh, we have, uh, once we realize that something that we thought was perfect is imperfect, sometimes we overreact to it. And so you need to have uh, you know, some, some mitigating forces. You need to have friends and others who are looking at the same issue, but from a slightly different perspective, help you moderate and modulate how you, how you react. And so uh, there are no two nations that trust each other as much as the United States and Australia. We can be really candid with each other. I know that because I was, you know, <laughs> ambassador. the forefront of it. Absolutely. Yes, and so I, I had some very candid conversations with my counterparts here, and, and that's healthy. And it allowed us to know when we were probably going a little too far uh, and not simply react to domestic pressures, but think you know, more broadly, long term, about is this good for democracy or not. And how do you see the role of multilaterals and bilaterals playing into this technology era? You know, when we've got quite defined national systems or attempt to kind of think about security and defence at a national level and we're playing with this uh, you know, unfettered, borderless reality that is digital. Yeah, well, you know, it, it's borderless, but it could form borders. And you can already see 
a way in which that could happen. There are a number of countries that are more autocratic, more authoritarian, and they look at these technologies and they see this is a way to enforce control. Um, I can have greater surveillance of uh, people within, uh, with, w within our country and I'll be able to know when they are trying to challenge uh, my policies or my leadership. Uh, I'll be able to visit and see who's, who's going to which websites. Uh, I'll be able to um, use subtle forms and effects uh, to let them know they need to back off, shutting down their computers, um, scrambling some of the uh, things that they need in, in their digital world, uh, or actually showing up at their door mm. and hauling them off. Uh, and you could easily have a, um, a cold war in, in cyber. You could have the old, you know, liberal international order uh, that believes in civil rights and human rights trying to maintain the internet space in one way and authoritarian countries trying to maintain it in another and using tools uh, that we think are off limits uh, but that they find uh, advantage them domestically and they're willing to use internationally. We're already seeing some of that some of those friction points. So one of the real challenges is to work out among ourselves what we think are workable norms that will last, mm -hmm. and then try to develop an international consensus around them. We had to do that in you know, law of the sea. <laughs> There's no more piracy uh, allowed. Uh, we had to do that in space. You can't start shooting down satellites and creating this you know, knock-on effects. Uh, every space in which human beings occupy, we've had to work out those international norms. We have to do it again in this one. I, and that's what I wanted to ask you, really, is on balance, are you a tech optimist or pessimist? I'm an optimist. Um, Somehow doesn't surprise <laughs> me about you, knowing your personality. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I once heard, uh, I always wondered why people were pessimists, and I heard George Will finally give a good explanation for that. He said, when you're a pessimist, either you're right or you're pleasantly surprised. You know, <laughs> so there's that. But I, I, I've never understood why you wouldn't want to be an optimist. Yeah. Um, but I also think history has has shown optimism is is the way to go. We all want the same thing. People want to um, have lives where they live where they want, love the people they want, uh, give their children a better life than the one that they had, and you know, and and really experience this the short journey that we have on Earth. You know, we're all we're all mortal, and we all have essentially the same same hopes and dreams in our life. And we will work really hard to make sure that those things happen, if not for ourselves and at least for, for the next generation, for our children. And so no matter what challenge has been thrown at us, people find a way through it. I mean, I, I think about the second industrial revolution, which produced two world wars and a great depression, um, in addition to you know, a, a, a fantastic new economy that has um, uh, empowered all of us. Uh, and the people who are going through that period, they came up with some fabulous ideas for how to you know, reduce the exploitation of workers, to ensure that people who were working in this system got to share the wealth of it, that people were properly educated to take it full advantage and participate and be good citizens, uh, that they, they, they amped up democracy. They started conserving uh, the planet and, and developing more environmental uh, stewardship rules. I mean, they, they came up with some really smart ideas during an extraordinarily painful period. And they weren't just thinking about themselves, they were thinking about the future. I think we'll do the same. You mentioned the next generation. We're here at a, a university. I know you're personally yes. very passionate about education, chair of the, the International Fulbright Board as well. Yes. What do you think we need to be doing to prepare the next generation for this new world order? People that are in schools and in universities right now. Well, I think the very first thing is we need to start having students think about this world as as a full world, a complete ecosystem. Not think about it in terms of, well, this is an add-on. Mm. <laughs> uh, uh, once you change your mindset, uh, you start to see how, how it intersects with every aspect of your life, um, physical world and, and virtual world. Uh, I think uh, the second thing we need to do is adapt our education, not only to how, they, how, how um, students learn in this environment, but anticipate that they're gonna to need to learn over the course of their lives. This is gonna be, instead of four years preparing you for the rest of your life, 
uh, we're going to be retrained throughout our lives because AI and other technologies are going to nibble away at the, the skills that we had that were once valued. They'll become less valued, and we're going to have to adapt to new skills. Um, that's not bad. I think it's going to be a much more interesting life, more interesting careers, more varied, um, more challenges, and, and, um, and, and more adventurous. But it's going to be different, and I think we need to start preparing people for both of those realities, that they live in a new world, and that they're going to have to be educated very differently over the course of a much longer life. One of the conversations we're seeing emerge across the globe with regards to the digital world that we're moving into is this notion of digital citizen rights and, and yes. being a digital citizen. How do you think about this new world order when it comes to human rights? Yeah, I think um, you know the, the the notion of being a digital citizen. Again, we're, we're there are there there may not be a physical borders. Um, but there are um, borders in terms of what people's expectations of their lives are. Um, I think of um, you know individuals saying, you know, I'm a citizen of the world. Well, you, yeah, you know, citizen of the world, but you know, you only get to use one or two passports. You only get to vote yeah. in one place. There are there are limitations, and I think depending on where you are in the world. Um, your sense of security with respect to cyber is going to be very different depending upon the national boundaries in which you operate. Your, um, the, the risks that you take by expressing your ideas will be very different. Your, um, uh, your, your notion of your own agency, as you said, um, and, and where you fit in the world will be a reflection to some extent of uh, the environment you grow up in. And if it's a brutal environment, <laughs> you're going to find that brutality in, uh, in your internet space. If it's one that is more empowering for people, more uh, diverse, more inclusive, uh, more focused on developing equity you're, um, and, and equality, I think you're going to find a, you're living in a different world even though you call yourself a digital citizen. One of the things you mentioned last night when you were launching the centre was how different uh, a world order we're in in terms of the, the pace of change, the level of connectedness, the, the new business models, just fundamentally different reality to what we ever could have conceived of 10, 20 years ago. How is that changing what's demanded of leaders? How do you see leaders playing into this space? I think leaders are about to go through a massive transformation because, and, and we see this in every major revolution like this. If you're a leader, Normally, you got elected based upon some issues that have been, you know, building for the last 10 years. And, you know, you get elected on those and you're going to work on them for the next 10 years. And hopefully, after 20 years, that issue gets solved. Um, the pace of change and the acceleration uh, is so dramatic that politicians who are coming in saying, well, I'm going to solve last year's problem, <laughs> are going to find themselves feeling irrelevant. Um, what they really need to do is um, start a, a, uh, anticipating problems two, three, four years out and, and use their leadership, lose, use their, their, their position uh, to start developing the uh, arms of government to address those and start explaining to the public why you know, these priorities that you wouldn't expect us to be working on are going to matter so much. Uh, I'm, you know, uh, there, there are things that I worry about. Uh, the, the debate about 5G mm. is so immature at this point, and it's coming at us incredibly quickly. The, the, the discussion about autonomous vehicles, mm. you know, if you're a bus driver, a truck driver, a cab driver, an Uber driver, a forklift driver, um, your, your way of life, your livelihood is about to change uh, dramatically or be eliminated. Um, and that's one of the most important um, um, sources of work in, uh, in many of the Western industrialized countries. In California, it's the number one job. And so um, we're not having that conversation as a, as a country. Uh, I, I think that's the role of leaders, is to get out ahead of those issues and start tackling them now. Um, uh, and, and I think leaders who don't do that um, will, will start falling very quickly. You touched on such a good point, I think, that we're suspended in quite an immature discussion on a lot yeah. of these topics. How do we drive, you know, obviously the centre is going to play a key role in that, but how do we empower ourselves to be more informed and be engaging in more robust conversations so we're actually doing justice to making decisions on these topics? Yeah, I think there are a couple things. One is uh, what we're doing right now, um, we wouldn't have had this conversation five years ago. Um, the centre like this wouldn't have been built five years ago. And I think... Um, uh, 
you know, the regeneration of our species is, is, is what keeps us going because this new generation of, of leaders, the next generation, uh, grew up as digital natives. Mm -hmm. And for them, these issues, they, they immediately get them. Um, they, they, they sense that something isn't working. Um, they're anxious about their futures as a result and they're prepared to do something. And I, I, I think we're gonna see a, a, a sea change in, um, in leadership. The fact that you've got a tight grip and authoritarians, that's what happened in the beginning of um, the second industrial revolution. Um, by the end of the second industrial revolution, you had a very different kind of leader. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, in that answer there the conversation around 5G. Yeah. If you were to nominate a handful of key issues and challenges that you'd say leaders have got to get across and do their best to inform themselves on these matters because these are significant for the world, they're significant for all of us, what would you say the, the handful of challenges you'd encourage them to, to be reading about and informing themselves about? Let's see. Well, I think, you know, looking at AI, um, and, and I can go through what some of the issues are for each of these, but I, a, AI is clearly one. Autonomy is another one. 5G mobility is a third. I think you have to think about blockchain, um, both as a great opportunity uh, and, and also start to anticipate its challenges. Uh, I think um, uh, this, is, this, this era that's coming up, if the last era was about physics, the next one will be about biology. We're gonna fundamentally change how people, um, you know, how, how, how people conceive of our own species. And I think our species is gonna change. I think humanity is gonna be very different um, at the end of this century than it is right now. Uh, it's a hard thing to contemplate, but we will, um, because we'll be augmented by tools that we've developed. We'll be living much, much longer and we'll have different expectations about what life is like. And we are using the technologies that we're already using. We're changing the way our brains are wired, the way we think about the world. And the question is gonna be, do we, take the best parts of our humanity, including some of the emotional messy parts of it, and make those better? Um, or do we sort of bring ourselves down to a level where it's all about you know, the logic rational, um, but really sort of lose, lose those, those qualities that uh, at the end of the day make us happy about being human beings, the sadness and the, and, and the wonderful joys that we have. And as you, it really links back to what you were saying earlier around the importance of intentional choice and yes. navigating all this with a consciousness, because I think yeah. a lot of the impact it's had on our biology and the gearing of our brains to date, for example, has happened without an awareness or an appreciation for the way our technology habits have, have started to change our neurology, for example. Yeah, no, no. I mean, when you talk about the fact that um, uh, we have these increased rates of anxiety, depression, mm -hmm. suicide ideation among young people, they're more connected, but they feel more isolated. Um, these are, you know, these are these are real challenges. Not all of them are due to technology, um, but technology is definitely playing a role in some of those uh, some of those developments. And how do we how do we address that? Uh, I think the other thing is we're going to know so much more about how our bodies work. We're going to be able to figure out exactly what you should eat. Um, for you personally, based on your DNA, mm -hmm. based upon um, other aspects of, um, of of just how 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 you're put together physically, and and then we're going to have to do something very different, which is once you know exactly what you need to do in order to live a, a really healthy and good life, we're going to have to have to do it. <laughs> and and there'll that's, be no plausible deniability anymore, will there? <laughs> right, and we won't do it because yeah. that's what human Humans beings do. do. I mean, we yeah. already know we're supposed to exercise yeah. every day, and we're not supposed to, you know, eat French fries. And, <laughs> to your you point, know. humans take their humanity yeah. everywhere. <laughs> yeah, and so the question is, how can we take our humanity and start coaching each other? and find what motivates each one of us, and it's always different, um, to do the things that will make our lives more fulfilling. Because we will have a roadmap that no other prior generation had for how to make our lives more fulfilling. Um, there, there are gonna be opportunities for us to coach each other, to connect with each other, to do good things with this, and I think restore some of that humanity and take away that sense of isolation. But it's gonna be up to us. It's really gonna be up to us. And, and, and so what I love about this center is the center is thinking in those kind of sweeping terms. It's not saying we're here to make sure the disinformation campaigns do not allow people to distort our ability to understand the truth. Yeah. We're saying that is just one piece of a much broader sweep of, of social movement uh, that we need to get out ahead of. 
I feel like it would be remiss of me on the audience's behalf not to circle back to those couple of challenges and just ask you to elaborate on AI and autonomy and blockchain. What are the handful of points you'd say are your particular areas of concern? Okay, well, um, I'll do 5G first because um, it's, it's front of mind for me. Look, 5G, I think, will fundamentally change um, how, we, how, how we move. It, it, it sort of takes, takes a lot of the evolution of um, uh, our digital world and um, making it more mobile, making it more accessible, making it faster, making it you know, uh, easier for us to understand. Um, and it's going to take it to a whole new level. Because anywhere we go, we will have um, rapid access to all the digital technology uh, that we can imagine. And every device that we create will be designed with that in mind. And, and it will be gathering our data and it will be uh, attending to our personal individualized needs and in ways that prior generations could never have imagined. Mm. And so it'll be kind of nice. You can wake up in the morning and you know your thermostat will go to just the right temperature for you and your coffee will start brewing for you and your favorite song will come on. And <laughs> you, know, you can, um, uh, you know, you want to... You want to talk to uh, uh, your parents? You just, you know, you just whisper the thought to yourself, and suddenly you know, a you're hologram connected. will pop up. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, they're right there in front of you. Yeah. So you know, you can imagine the the positive elements of mm -hmm. it. At the same time, it means that every single choice you make, every thought you have, every uh, every aspect of how you move through the world is being gathered in these devices. Um, and it's being constantly updated in ways that can't really be controlled by our current cybersecurity technologies. Mm -hmm. There will be massive opportunities for, um, uh, for mischief and for genuine harm mm -hmm. uh, to be performed through those devices. And we need a governance structure that is going to be prepared for that. The fact that we're not thinking in those terms um, should concern all of us. Because 5G is... You know, now, it, it's coming because it's a good technology, just like autonomous vehicles are coming because they are um, Pareto superior, they're better. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, uh, they're only better if we manage them properly. Mm. Uh, they can, they can um, do real damage if we don't. Yeah, absolutely. When it comes to AI and automation? Um, so automation, as I said, one of the big challenges for automation is going to be that they automation will um, was designed to relieve people of drudgery. <laughs> um, it's really anything that is dull, dangerous, determinable can be done by a machine. Human beings don't have to do that. Uh, we're meant for something better. Mm -hmm. What we're worried about is that it will deny us and it will relieve us of purpose. Mm -hmm. um, and we need, we need purpose. Um, I think everyone needs really three things. Um, something to do, someone to love, and something to look forward to. That's, that's what we are. And if you take away the something to do and something to look forward to, um, you've diminished us as, as, as people. Mm -hmm. So autonomy, uh, we need to figure out how we, how we take that great tool and then start moving people into, in, into that higher space, uh, the more evolved human space. Um, and then AI. I think AI, one of the big challenges for us with AI is that um, we will outthink ourselves. Mm. We, will, we will literally um, you know, um, outsmart ourselves. I'll give you one example of that. Uh, right now, if you go to YouTube, <laughs> now, you know, YouTube is, is a business, and so what they want is they want your eyeballs on the screen. They're trying to get your attention. Absolutely. So what they do is, um, you know, at the end of a YouTube video, they used to do like three, two, one, and you know that that will keep your attention because you know we we respond to queuing. That's the way our brains work. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, someone's coming. I'm going to stay. Anticipation, right, right? Anticipation, and and then they give you a a menu of um, other videos that you could watch, and the idea is for YouTube is not, we want you to watch this particular video. We just want to know what people are drawn to, and we'll push those up higher and higher in the queue because um, that makes it more likely that you'll watch it too because we know this is the popular choice. So it turns out that the way our brains work is that we like, um, uh, we like more extreme versions of things. So if you're a parent, you go onto a website, what you want to see is, um, you know, how did... Why does my kid have these bumps on their hand, foot, and tongue? Um, 
because it looks pretty scary. And so you put that in and, and you find a video on hand, foot, and mouth disease. Yeah, and Dr. Google harmless. sends you some bad places. <laughs> yeah, well, the next thing you see is a vaccine and you probably want to look at that because you're like, okay, well, do you get vaccinated for hand, foot, and mouth disease? And then the next thing that'll come up is an anti-vax conspiracy video because if you're looking at a vaccination thing and then you see, you know, vaccinations will kill your child, you're like, oh, maybe I should look at that. Um, and YouTube has inadvertently, it's not trying to do this, but it has inadvertently fueled this anti-vax conspiracy theory, which is really dangerous for humanity. Um, that's the kind of thing where we outsmart ourselves. We figure out how to fool the brain into keeping your eyeballs on the screen. You think you're doing it neutrally, but you're actually driving people in a, in a negative direction. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, blockchain? Blockchain. I think right now I'm, I'm bullish on blockchain, and it's, so it means that I haven't fully thought through the, the challenges. I think the positive aspects of it are that we need truth and trust, and it gives you an, a complete ledger. It can also relieve governments of the things that they tend to be really bad at. They're, they're good at record keeping, but in a really cumbersome, slow, bureaucratic way, and you can allow the government to start meeting the public's expectations by moving much more quickly. Um, or create third, third parties that can do this just as well, and the government can be relieved of that responsibility altogether. Um, I think there are really positive aspects of blockchain. I think what could become dangerous is as we move into cryptocurrency with, um, with blockchain, um, whenever you're talking about people's wealth and money, um, the most dangerous minds are going to be thinking of the most diabolical plots. Mm -hmm. And I haven't really figured out exactly how diabolical, I just know that they will. <laughs> Because uh, there's always people trying to steal from others. Uh, we're human beings. And so that, I think, is the biggest challenge. Because blockchain is going to be essential to that. It's going to fuel the, the cryptocurrency movement. And, um, and, and there will be some uh, tough sledding at, in, until we get that really solved. Uh, we've talked a lot about kind of state agents and new people that are being empowered by technology, but there's yeah. also the technology companies in themselves that come under this governance agenda that we've got to be thinking through. How do you see public-private partnership or the private sector's role playing in governance in, in this space? Yeah, I already see um, uh, tech companies adjusting their behaviour because uh, they're recognised as being more than just a company, more than just a, 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 a profitable uh, enterprise that's designed to, to make money for their shareholders. They're, they're really understood as an integral and essential part of society and how we live and work. And uh, the people who go to work for them expect uh, them to be good citizens. I think of these big companies the way people think about utilities, mm -hmm. which is everyone needs energy. Um, generally, it's, you know, you're gonna have one energy provider. They have to behave differently than other businesses. They're not selling potato chips, you know? They're, they're creating the space in which you live and they have a different set of responsibilities. So I, I think these companies are already starting to evolve and change. They see the backlash and that's already started, the tech lash. And, um, and I think that's, that's healthy because it's forcing them to see that they occupy a different space than most for-profit businesses. Jeff, we've covered such a wide array of, of topics in our conversation. We've touched on humanity, defence, security, governance, you name it. Yeah, you're a good interview. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, a lot of people listening, I think part of the challenge with this whole conversation is they feel a little overwhelmed. What yeah. would be your encouragement for those who are listening to this exchange about where to start, what to do yeah. tomorrow differently to what they might have done today? Look, I think the first thing people need to appreciate is it's okay to feel that way. I think that right now, as in prior periods of disruption, the public started to feel this pain. You feel overwhelmed. So much is happening so quickly and I, I don't feel like I can keep up with it. You feel undervalued because the things that are suddenly being measured um, are, are, are not necessarily the things that make a good citizen or a good person. Mm -hmm. Productivity and profitability aren't the only things that make us, you know, we're looking for leadership, we're looking for um, for, for kindness, we're looking for integrity, we're looking for uh, inspiration. We're looking for things that are, that are very hard to measure. Mm -hmm. And so there's a sense that you have those things and you're not being valued for them. Uh, and I think um, people also feel manipulated. 
because there's so much data that's being used in ways that they hadn't anticipated and they didn't feel they consented to. So if you feel that way, that's okay. You, you know, this, this, this is a normal part of the process. Um, the next step is to um, it, 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 it start acting on it. So in whatever way that people are feeling manipulated, there are things they can do. There are places like the, you know, our center, which is designed to um, help demystify this. And so we're, we're writing pieces that are intended for public consumption. And they are intended to help people see around corners and understand why they feel the way they do. Um, there are other centers that are doing this as well. You know, Center for Humane Technology and other places are designed to help people start unpacking and understanding the challenges that they have. I think the next step is going to be um, starting to demand more from our leaders. And when you're making your decisions, first, you got to vote. Yeah. <laughs> and when you vote, start looking for people who are talking about these issues and not the issues from 30 years ago, which mm -hmm. we keep hearing about. Um, it's true. Know, We're still suspended yeah. in a former d debate, aren't we? Oh, yeah. No, no. I mean, if you, if you go back and you watch presidential debates from 30 years ago, it's shocking how much it's the same issues because both parties have gamed that system. They know what their wedge issues are. I think we need to let politicians and leaders know that's not the only thing we care about. There's been a little bit going on in the last 30 years. Maybe you want to pay attention <laughs> yeah, to that too. Um, so I, I, but, but that's what happened with the progressive movement in the 1920s. The progressives, they, they, they saw both parties locked up in the same old stale debate and they started coming up with all new solutions. Mm -hmm. They came up with wage and hour laws and health and safety laws and, 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 and collective bargaining agreements. They came up with um, uh, antitrust laws and anti-monopoly laws and the federal income tax and where they had to, in the US, we had to change our constitution to do that. They changed the, the whole education model and started adding public high school as, um, as, as, as free high school education for everyone so they'd be prepared. The schools became more industrial in their design uh, to prepare people for that economy. There was an empowering of our democracy. Um, women, women achieved the right to vote in the United States. Um, senators became elected popularly instead of by the legislature. There were massive changes, including you know, the conservation movement. All those things happened because people rose up and said, we don't want our workers exploited. We want to get have everyone share in the wealth that we're helping to create. We want to make sure that you're listening to us and we have a supercharged mm. democracy. We don't want to spoil our environment. And it was the public that drove a whole new movement, a whole new debate in society then. We can do that now. I love that. What a great uh, positive note to finish on, the power of us individually and also yes. collectively. Jeff, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the international leadership you're providing in this space and, and congratulations on the launch of the centre. Thank you, Holly. And thank you for your leadership too.